All right, looks like we, we've, we've stabilized for the number of participants, so we're, we're going to get started. Uh, so welcome everyone to this, uh, this session hosted by the Crypto Valley Association. I'm Kyle Downey from Talos, Head of Portfolio Solutions. Uh, we have with us today Paula Orahel, Co-Founder and CEO of Hyla Fund Management. Uh, so first, thank you to the CBA for hosting and uh, coordinating this. Thank you, Paula, for, uh, for joining. Uh, we have a bunch of things to cover. Uh, we're going to kind of run through this fireside chat for, for everybody. Uh, and then at the end, uh, hopefully we have a time for questions. Please make use of the Q&A uh, feature. I have that open. Um, we'll uh, kind of keep an eye on that. And if we have time for questions at the end, uh, happy to uh, address as many of those as we can. Uh, Saskia from uh, CBA is also going to share our profiles with everyone. Uh, if you do want to reach out afterward with follow-on questions, I think both of us would be uh, happy to continue the conversation on topics that you're really interested in. Uh, just a very quick disclaimer, this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as either investment advice or solicitation or offer to purchase any securities. We will be touching on the topic of investment in crypto here. Uh, so, Paula, just to, to, to start, I'd uh, love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about the, the path that took you into crypto. So everyone has their, their own journey into the industry. Yes. And first, thank you, everyone, for joining today. And thank you, Kyle, for having me and Saskia as well. I feel very grateful for the opportunity. Um, so my career is has been taking a very interesting path. I'm originally from Mexico City, and I started my career creating and implementing e-learning platforms for big companies like Semex. Um, because of that, I was brought to the U.S. to create and implement similar e-learning platforms for retail companies like Target. Um, after that, I switched to traditional finance in the early 2000s, when I, where I worked for over 16 years in different capacities, primarily for family offices, hedge funds, and also as a banker for HSBC. I learned about crypto in a very early stage. I learned about Bitcoin in 2010. It was not even a dollar. However, I was not able to buy it. It's one of those very sad stories in crypto uh, because it was not as accessible as, as it is today. And in traditional finance, you always needed to report what, whatever you bought. So I was very afraid of touching it. However, my curios curiosity got triggered and I started going to all the meetups that started happening in, in, in Brooklyn at the time where only computer programmers were assisting and some curious people like myself. So I started going really into the rabbit hole of the meaning of blockchain technology. And I got very passionate about it. Maybe it's because I always been very excited and passionate about technology, but also because coming from a country like Mexico, I understood the tremendous opportunity that it could give to some people, especially in terms of financial inclusion and access. So I got, I went into the rabbit hole. At the same time, uh, one of my best friends at the time, who was in New York as myself, Andrew Hoppin, who's one of my partners and the CIO of the funds, asked me what do I thought about blockchain. We both share the same passion and vision about the technology. So I decided to go back and work in technology for a high frequency trading computer programming platform run by Arthur Whitney, who is one of the, in my opinion, one of the most powerful computer scientists alive today. He has written at least like five computer programming languages from scratch. So he hired me as his head of business development. And this position helped me a lot because he was exploring the possibility in applying his new computer programming language into a layer one, meaning creating a new blockchain. So we analyzed every blockchain available. At the time, it was primarily Bitcoin and Ethereum to really understand the potential of each of them. So I learned a lot. So in 2016, Andrew talked to me, invited me to participate in a partnership, but we didn't know where to start. We both knew that we wanted to participate in the space. But back in the day, the only common denominator that a lot of founders and managers have is that we didn't know where the technology was going. It was too new. So for us, it actually makes sense to launch a hedge fund of funds. 
And that's how Chainlink Capital, it used to be our name at, in 2018, we launched our first strategy in January 2018, what we call the Liquid Venture Fund of Funds. So now we have transitioned more, not only into hedge fund of funds, but we are building what we call a multi-manager, multi-strategy platform, where we also offered more liquid strategies. So illiquid and liquid strategies. So I'm very excited about the future, but I'll stop right there. Yeah, so let, let's touch on that a little bit. So uh, sort of the fund of fund structure is one approach, the multi-manager is another. How do you see the role of fund of fund structures in particular, and especially in crypto? Like what's their unique value proposition uh, for asset managers, but also for allocators? That's a great question. And I get asked that a lot. And by the way, for a little bit more background, when we launched the fund, I thought it was going to be so easy to raise capital. For me, there was no other strategy that makes sense uh, with the high volatility that we have in this space. But I think it's important to share the reasoning behind why we launched a fund of funds rather than going straight into a direct investment strategy. Back in 2016, when we first started considering the possibility of launching a project or a fund, Andrew was a member of the Hillary Edmund Foundation in New Zealand. He was surrounded by some of the early ad adopters and OGs in the blockchain space. And what stood out to him was that while everyone agreed blockchain was here to stay, no one could agree on where exactly the technology was headed. The risk was too high to place all our eggs in one basket, especially in such a new space. So we really, we believe that a fund of funds in crypto acts like a bridge between complexity and accessibility. The crypto space is still incredibly new and rapidly evolving. And that makes it difficult for investors who might not have the specialized knowledge or resources to dive into individual crypto hedge funds. So we wanted to simplify that process. As we know, by the way, the concept of a fund of funds is new. It's being a tried and tested method in traditional finance. But I personally believe in crypto, it holds even more value because of how fragmented and complex this space can be. So in other words, instead of putting all your capital into a single strategy, a fund of funds spreads across multiple hedge funds, each with its own approach and sectors. So this diversification is key, especially given how volatile the crypto markets are. So if you're an allocator trying to balance risk and find alpha, it's almost impossible to track every crypto fund or carry out the necessary due diligence on all of them. And I, I think that's where we come in. So at Hyla, we take on that responsibility, the responsibility of finding the top managers, evaluating their strategies, and ensuring they align with not only the risk tolerance, but also the goals of our investors and potential investors. So I think the biggest value proposition here is access. Some of the highest performing crypto hedge funds have either high minimum investments or are entirely close to new investors. And thanks to our relationships in the space, we have the second longest track record in the industry. We can open doors to those otherwise inaccessible opportunities. So even for funds that are open to investors, sometimes the minimum investments can be really high. But with us, by pulling capital, we lower that entry barrier. So, but not everything is positive, obviously, you know, and there are some trade-offs. One common concern with a fund of funds is the additional layer of fees. Yes, you're paying the fees of the underlying hedge funds plus the management and performance fees we charge. But in many cases, we have been able to negotiate better terms because of our relationships with these managers. So while there is an extra fee layer, you are also gaining access, diversification, and expert due diligence. I kind of like to think of the fees as your value, value added because you're paying for expertise, risk management, opportunities that might not be available to individual investors. So I think in crypto, where regulation is still catching up and the market can be wild, our fund offers a level of that diversification that reduces some of the risks associated with single manager exposure. So for example, a good example of this, and I get excited about sharing this, is 
in 2022, with a follow-up of FTX, most direct crypto managers had an average exposure of 16%, with some as high as 90%. For us, as a fund of funds, our exposure was only about 4%. So while your returns might be slightly lower due to the extra fees, the risk of losing capital is also much lower. Um, so yeah, well, do you still have to digest the additional fee layer? I believe the benefits of access, diversification, and due diligence that we offer really make it worth, worth it for those who want exposure to crypto, but they aren't quite ready to go all in on picking individual hedge funds. And let's remember that this is a 24 seven market. So, you know, the fund of funds, they play a role as an allocator. So you're talking to, you know, the various funds, but you are, yourself are also speaking to allocators and you spent the last two months traveling. I know you just very recently came back home uh, to, to Mexico City. Um, and so I'd love to kind of hear what you're hearing from investors, including about like those specific strategy interests and just share some insights from your recent travels. Uh, particularly out in Asia with sort of uh, it being conference season uh, 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 out there for blockchain. Absolutely. Um, by the way, I'm still, the jet lag, I just came back yesterday, the jet lag still like hitting me. So I apologize if my brain is not working properly, but, uh, but yes, I have visited six countries in two months um, in Asia. Um, I as, I attended major blockchain events like Korea Blockchain Week, Token 2049, and the Network State Conference. Um, but beyond these events, I had a chance to meet with a wide range of investors and fund managers, and really the insights um, have been fascinating. Um, what I've seen across the board is that investors are really focused on navigating today's volatile landscape, particularly with the current liquidity challenges. Everyone is hunting for alpha, but with a sharper focus on, on correlated strategies that can act as a hedge against broader ma macro risk. And it makes sense, um, given that the global financial markets are still feeling the impact of the elevated interest rates and the inflationary pressures. One thing that really stood out to me was the distinct profile of investors I encounter and I met with. For high net worth individuals and in smaller investors, liquidity is a key con concern. A lot of them are frustrated because they are stuck in investments they made a few years back, or their capital is tied up in venture funds with long lockup periods. So they need flexibility. Now, on the flip side, larger family offices and asset managers are taking advantage of this environment. They're more leveraged to negotiate better terms for direct investments, and they're scooping up deals at lower valuations. This pattern was consistent, by the way, across both crypto and traditional investors. Now, in terms of what strategies are catching attention, I noticed a couple of things depending on the type of investment. So, I'll say that for those allocating to crypto funds, market neutral strategies and quantitative or AI driven models are big right now. Market neutral strategies take long and short positions to neutralize market exposure, allowing investors to profit from the relative performance of individual assets. This is especially appealing, obviously, in volatile markets like crypto. Now, quant and AI models, which exploit market inefficiency across different asset classes, are also gaining popularity because they offer uncorrelated returns. Now, for non-crypto investors, what I've seen or what they share with me is that commodity-focused funds are becoming more attractive. Commodities like gold, silver, and energy products have a local relation with traditional equities, making them great inflation hedges. Also event-driven strategies, which focus on corporate events like mergers and acquisitions are also, are also right now on the rise since they offer returns that are tied to broader market movements. On the direct investment side, um, I think the major trend continues to be in artificial intelligence. It's still the hottest sector, I think followed by cybersecurity. And I really want to emphasize this. Cybersecurity, cyber attacks is a concern across the board for small and large investors, including, including family offices. Also, alternative healthcare 
I feel like it's gaining more traction as well. On the blockchain side, I'm seeing continued interest in areas like gaming. And again, I'm talking about Asia specifically, and I think gaming is important because historically, Seoul has been an innovation hub for important gaming, even before blockchain. Also, I've seen interest in, continued interest in decentralized finance and tokenization of real world assets like RWA as well, though I think there's still a lot of debate about what RWA tokenization really means in practice. Two other trends that grab my attention that I was not expecting they will be that strong during, during these interviews and meetings that I had are the growing interest in front-end markets like Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as well as investment centered more around community building and research into human connectivity and consciousness. A great example of this is a presentation that Vitalik Buterin made during the Network State Conference with his project Sulalu, which is a pop-up city. Um, this project brings together members of the Ethereum community to explore topics like human longevity and collective prob problem solving. So it's very interesting to me because I've been talking about this for a few years now. I've been saying how as we implement these emerging technologies more across the world, we will start, there's no, there's no question about this, and maybe this is a little bit controversial, but there's no question about it that we will get replaced by AI. Now, the, the, the interesting thing here is, as we get replaced for AI, what are we gonna do with our time? And I think these type of communities will, will make more sense then. I think the importance on understanding what human consciousness really means uh, versus something created by artificial intelligence is becoming more and more relevant. And what it really means human connectivity and cr creating communities and connection. So I think that's fascinating. So that's overall what I observe. So I wanted to pull on two things that, that you referred to there. The, the first one was just about this concept of, of liquid venture uh, and this kind of alternative category, because we did see this pullback post FTX where we saw like crypto hedge funds converting to venture funds, uh, people preferring only token investments. Like it was almost like a sign of conservatism or, or, or like backlash of like, well, if, if I'm going to take this risk, I want the hundred X out of that. Uh, but you often yeah. talk about this concept of, of liquid venture, and I'd, I'd love for you to elaborate on that a little bit as a strategy and like, how you see sort of the relationship between uh, the more liquid funds and the VC funds in the space? Yeah, that that is such an interesting question because we've been talking about liquid venture since pretty much 2017. Um, so overall at, at Hyla, what we observe is, or we also notice is that there's a continuous strong demand for from our investors for greater liquidity. Uh, not only in Asia, right? So all over the world. Um, in terms of, and I'll make a pause here and I will talk about the liquid venture specifically, that's your question. But I also want to mention that um, because of the appetite of, or the strong demand of greater liquidity, that's why our partnership with Amphibian Capital and their market neutral fund of funds is so valuable because Really, their team has been delivering consistent positive returns for almost two years. Uh, so again, I mean, this sounds like a pitch, but it's not. But I highly recommend you to, if there are any people interested or curious about these strategies, to check out their strategies at the website, at amphibiancapital.com. Because I think that both strategies in a platform, like the one that we are building, actually makes sense because we're really position to offer like an all weather portfolio for institutional investors interested in crypto. Okay, with that say, that's a boss. So on our side for high, on the HILA side, uh, we, as I said before, we have been managing the liquid venture strategy with great success. Um, it's a fund of funds. Um, this strategy is really unique 
to the digital asset space. Because in traditional finance, you often have to wait for years until an IPO or an acquisition for liquidity. But in the blockchain world, projects can issue tokens that are tradable much earlier, giving investors access to liquidity at a much faster pace. So to be clear also, Liquid Venture doesn't offer 100% liquidity in early stage blockchain projects, but it does provide far more flexibility compared to traditional venture capital. Um, we are able to acquire pre-market tokens at a steep discount. I mean, sometimes even like between 80 and 90% be below the launch price. And when these tokens hit the market, we've seen returns as high as 10 to 100X. So these tokens often come with vesting periods. So it's not easy to manage these type of strategies. And once again, I, I want to emphasize the fact that we are a hedge fund of funds. So we rely on our underlying managers to manage the positions and the liquidity terms. Um, and I believe this is a very critical uh, component of these strategies. Um, but the reality is that the liquidity of our underlying managers that they offer in this space is something that just doesn't exist in traditional venture. Um, also, there's another, there's a new element playing into the space, right? And, and, and it's very new, so I, I don't think I can speak exactly how that's going to play out. But let's not forget that AI has the potential to, resa to reshape the venture capital landscape as well. Um, we've seen that it can enhance decision-making processes, it can improve some of the risk management, it can increase operational efficiency, and facilitating, you know, in some cases, access to investment opportunities. Um, I think this is, not, this is not only potentially affecting the liquid venture strategies. I think both liquid venture and traditional venture can benefit from these advancements. But the impact may be particular pronounced in liquid venture where the agility and speed are essential. Um, so I think a very important consideration, you know, for the founders as well, because I think I've been focusing and talking more about on the investor side, but I think while venture capital can be great fit for some startups, it's not one size fits all, right? And many startups, especially those in new industries or with unconventional business models, may not align well with a traditional venture capital timelines or expectations. And yeah. I think in that sense, liquid venture capital models can enable different funding mechanisms that cater to a broader array of startups. And, um, and these will work by allowing more flexible investment structures, maybe such as like crowdfund crowdfunding and liquid venture can also democratize access to capital and potentially lead to asymmetric returns that retail investors usually can access. Uh, so in other words, I think like startups with liquid venture startups get iterate more quickly without the long-term commitments typical of traditional venture. And this flexibility is especially, is it, it has a special advantage for some sectors like software businesses, which can change and adapt fast based on the market feedback. So kind of going back to the, the allocators. So like your traditional crypto hedge fund allocators tend to be high net worth individuals, crypto OGs, Bitcoin whales, et cetera. Family offices have, have played a big role. We had a question. And by the way, to encourage everyone, I saw one hand raised, but please just put into the q and I'm keeping half an eye on the questions and I'll try to weave in your questions as well uh, so we can keep this uh, keep this interactive. Um, what do you kind of see as the risk appetite? Like, you know, do you see greater allocations coming from the uh, family offices? Is it still mostly like crypto angels, uh, like getting into the space uh, again a little bit more post FTX? Where are you seeing the pull? And like, what are where are people's heads in terms of like allocating to um, to this space to crypto? As I say before, Kyle, I think the appetite, it depends on the profile of the investor. For family offices, I I I just gave an interview very specialized, you know, about family offices and the difference in generational wealth and how different generations approach investment in a very different way. 
Um, I met with a few family offices and they're still very interesting in impact investment without saying not necessarily ESG, but their concern about climate change. They are definitely looking and you know seeking the alpha, but they also are much more mindful of where the alpha is coming from. So when it, when it comes down to crypto, unfortunately, we'll still have to deal with a very pure reputation. And why, what I observe, you know, when I attend all these conferences around the world, and I have to say it, and I have to call it out, and I'm part, I'm part of the crypto space and the blockchain space, um, we need to step it up. We we need to change the way we we launch or we present ourselves in the crypto in the crypto world with the with the crypto and the blockchain events um, that surround some of this conference. The constant feedback that I receive, especially from family offices and larger institutional investors, is that yes, to answer your question, they're they're interested. Yes, they know that even like big asset management firms, their investors and their clients, they want to have exposure to crypto and blockchain, but they don't know where to begin. with. And the issue is that a lot of these people are attending this conference with the hopes of meeting potential projects or managers to invest in. And when they go and they encounter some very, I don't know, techno-driven and crazy and wild crypto events, they get turned off and mm -hmm. they don't know what to do. So right. the interest is there to answer your question. I don't think I answered your question correctly, but the interest is there both from high network individuals and family offices. I just think that the process of investment is very different. I think naturally, you know, and again, going back to the amphibian capital funds, it is because they are Bitcoin and Ethereum denominated, we have two separate funds. Crypto whales understand the product. Crypto right, yeah. people, they already understand the benefits of blockchain because they had incredibly high returns and that's how they generated the wealth. So they're not shy about this space. They're not shy to taking some risk. Now, even them, they're taking a step back again in terms of liquidity and in terms of the strategies and the risk appetite. That's why I mentioned before, market natural strategies are the number one, I think, strategy that they're looking at. For a more traditional investor, they're very cautious and they're, I think they're sitting more on the sidelines, especially they're waiting for, for the results of the US elections in November. So another point to like pull back from your earlier uh, comments, um, just on tokenized assets and crypto. Um, uh, and this is controversial, at least within the crypto industry. There's a certain amount of uh, shade throwing that happens along the lines of, well, when things are bad, people talk about like private blockchains and tokenized assets. And we go back to the fun stuff when the market gets better. Uh, but, um, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective on the role of those. We, you know, a couple of them, we've started to see product market fit, but, you know, there have been a lot of kind of more proof of concept than anything else. What do you see that's interesting in that RWA space? Uh, do you think it is here to stay? And how do you see how it relates to crypto? Like, is crypto a transient thing or does it kind of, getting back to your point about liquid venture, perhaps have a future as a, dip, you know, an alternative fundraising model? Mm. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think, yes, I think we're witnessing a significant momentum in the tokenization, you know, of, uh, of real world assets, but especially with yield bearing assets, right? Like bonds and treasuries. I think that these markets are already highly liquid and efficient, making them prime candidates for tokenization. However, when you look beyond that, the broader market is still evolving. And I don't think the challenge, I think the challenge isn't necessarily the technology or liquidity. Um, those are progressing, that's my opinion. I think it's more about demonstrating the added value and clarifying the regulatory landscape. Um, I think in this sense, I believe like major players like the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and other Crypto exchanges might be the ones to lead the, ch the charge in tokenization. If they can show how tokenization 
positively impacts their bottom line. I think we could start seeing some real shifts. But I think convincing institutional investors to overhaul their back-end systems will take time. And tokenization needs to offer compelling advantages. I mean, I mean, for example, like how do we persuade institutions to adopt technology that relies on decentralized validation? These transactions are transparent for just a moment before they, they get finalized, right? So they raise trust issues. So in order to unlock large scale adoption, I think we need a careful balance between transparency, security, and privacy especially if tokenization is to fit into highly regulated financial markets. Um, but I personally believe that the potential integ integration with DeFi is incredibly promising. I think tokenized assets can serve as collateral in decentralized systems, they can provide liquidity, and around the clock markets, advantages that traditional finance simply, simply can have. But we really need to focus on product market fit to ensure that the end user experiences are seamless. So I truly believe that the real growth will come from tokenized assets that have the greatest inefficiencies today. Um, think about alternative assets like real estate, collectibles, and private equity. Tokenization can make a tangible impact by solving back office inefficiencies and creating a secondary market. Now, when we talk about real estate, and it's a trillion dollar market, especially when you talk about tokenization of real estate, I think we're not there yet. And we're not there yet because the complexity of the regulation of the different jurisdictions around the world is a big challenge. But I think we're making some progress. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure we're there. And I think for all of this innovation to happen, we need a clear legal framework. That's why I'm cautious. That's why I'm always cautious about using the term completely decentralized. I feel and I prefer that better distributor is a better term because I think we really need an in-between stage between a fully centralized um, world to go to a fully decentralized world. I think that we cannot transition from this fully decentralized system to a fully decentralized system overnight. And that evolution is happening now, but it is a critical part of the process. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think in my mind, um, we're not there yet. Yeah, and I think real estate is probably a good example of that. Someone pointed out to me, you know, there's still towns here in the U.S. with paper record keeping, there are certain things that have to happen. They're almost prerequisite for, for, for some of these things that people got excited about early on. Um, yes. so before we no, have sorry. I'm so sorry <laughs> that I interrupted a couple, but I was going to bring up also, right, and, and this is related to my trip in Asia. Um, we we get excited, you know, all over the world, you know, talking about these type of solutions. And RWA, of course, is the newest trend. But what I would invite people to really think about is that, for example, in Asia, and I was very impressed by it, especially in China, is a completely cashless society. All I needed to walk around and navigate China was my phone. In contrast, when you come back to America, and I'm talking about the whole continent, we still have so many, so many inefficiencies. Like you say, not only real estate, but like the healthcare industry, supply chain, we still rely on paper. We still rely on paper currency and coins. We have to carry them around. We still rely on our carrying our ID. I mean, it blows my mind that when we go to a doctor's appointment, we still have to write on a piece of paper our social security number. And we don't know where that's going, right? So there needs to be some transition and there needs to be something in between. Now, it's not impossible. It happened in China, right? I mean, this technological revolution and application specifically in that economy happened less than 20 years ago, which for me is fascinating, it's incredible. So with that say, I understand that with these emerging technologies, it could happen, but we need to start, I, I think the right word is patience. We need to have more patience, you know, with this space and with these technologies. I think we, 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 we need to be more mindful of that. 
Sorry, I interrupted you, Kyle. Yeah, that's quite all right. Um, you know, it's kind of a good point about some of the complexities, though, even for these digital solutions. You know, one key part for a fund of fund, or really anyone evaluating uh, a crypto hedge fund, is the operational side of things. You know, the processes that they have in place. So, you know, on on our side, you know, we're we're building a portfolio management system to help automate a lot of that. Uh, so I'm always interested to understand, particularly from the allocator side, you know, what are the risks that you most worry about? You know, what do you worry about those fund managers not being able to handle in terms of the operational processes that maybe are less of a worry when sort of you have all of those pieces from traditional finance that fund managers have relied upon to kind of keep things, uh, 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 keep things going smoothly, as opposed to, say, dealing with a bearer asset and some of the cybersecurity risks that you had alluded to before. I, absolutely. I, th I think that operational due diligence or ODD is a huge part of a funds manager's job, but especially for a fund of fund manager. Um, and especially even more in the crypto space uh, because it's such a fast paced and volatile environment that uh, ODD becomes essential in managing all the risk. So when, when it comes down to this risk, um, several key concerns stand out for me. Uh, the first one is counterparty risk. In a landscape with market dynamics and participants can change overnight, as we have seen, um, it's vital that we properly vet our counterparties. Without that due diligence, we are opening ourselves up to significant exposure. Are we seeing, you know, with what happened in the past with FTX is a major example, but there are many other. Another critical risk is liquidity risk. Even if an asset appears to have decent liquidity on the surface, that can go away much faster in crypto markets compared to traditional ones. Um, and we saw that with the aftermath of the FTX incident. Um, this has lighted the need, obviously, to find solutions that specifically to separate custody from exchange fun functions, uh, which it makes sense, right? Because that's exactly the way it works in traditional finance. I think this is crucial for risk mitigation. Um, as I said, similar to practice we see in traditional finance, where custodians are often highly regulated banks. Um, as for controls, I think that robust Going back to cybersecurity uh, measures, um, they're really not negotiable for us. I think like given the frequency of attacks we've seen, protecting assets is very, very important. Uh, we also need clear and transparent governance structures, especially when dealing with decentralized finance protocols. I think effective risk management is possible without a deep um, is impossible without a deep understanding of the technical architecture involved. So, and the only way to know this is to have extremely good communication with everyone involved. So for us on our side as a fund of funds, constant dialogue with our fund managers is essential. We need to regularly review and update, for example, signatories on custody accounts, we have to ensure everyone understands who has access to key wallets and security systems. And what we observed with some of the, I would say, mistakes in the past is that it's not often the technology that's the weak link. Rather, it's human error that can leave a fund very vulnerable. Um, that's why a strong due diligence process from the very beginning, particularly when, when we are selecting our underlying managers, is so important. So I think like to wrap it up or like in your case, I think it's important to consider uh, the overall landscape, you know, for due diligence, especially for our managers. We emphasize essential controls to strengthen our risk management fra framework constantly. And I think there are eight uh, controls that I that come to mind right now. One is having a clear risk assessment framework. Diversification is key, and I keep talking about diversification, and that's very important, you know, on the phone-to-phone -phone, um, 
level, but also, you know, in the funds that we invest. Um, a stress testing and a scenario analysis is very important. Real-time risk monitoring is also another consideration. Compliance controls, cybersecurity measures, um, communication, as I said. And the last but not least important that I think like sometimes we don't tend to look in the crypto space that it was very much enforced in traditional finance, the world that I come from, is having regular training and awareness programs, not only at the managing level, but also the whole team. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the human element, often the technology is ahead of the policy and the training uh, and the practices and the culture. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard this from multiple allocators, people on the insurance side, that, you know, the question on their minds is not like what self-custody wallet are you using? It's like, you know, are you using 203 signatures? Do you do you have other measures in place? What are your backups if keys are lost? These are things that like, they're not necessarily technology specific. They come up more uh, with, with crypto, but they are kind of some unique uh, uh, challenges that you, you need to have those uh, in place. We saw uh, managers with like literally tens of millions of dollars locked up on FTX who weren't thinking about that exchange custodian separation that you were talking about before. So, you know, quite a few hazards and uh, those controls are essential. Um, yes. And interesting enough, I, will, I would just like to add because again, crypto has such a bad reputation and the headlines also like another hacker and they lost another hundred million and so forth. But something that's very interesting to me is, again, it's not the technology's fault, but furthermore, we're actually able, they're actually able to identify those hacks and because it's blockchain technology, because we're able to trace down, you know, when it happens and how it happens. In traditional finance, it happens all the time. We just don't hear about it that often because they're not able, in most cases, they're not even able to track it down. So I think it's important also to remember that. Yeah, to me, one of the one of the great ironies is the degree to which we've reproduced uh, some problems of opacity and lack of transparency in a space, uh, you know, thing around like some of the CFI lenders, et cetera, um, uh, that, you know, is built on decentralization and transparency. But there certainly are places where, you know, it, it, it has done significantly better uh, than TradFi, and, and that's a the whole KYC AML aspect of it. I think people don't talk about that enough. Um, so, you know, to kind of wrap, wrapping up, like, you know, looking at these different structures, we kind of started with small specialist crypto funds that, that evolved to deal with these unique operational complexities. Where do you see it going? You know, is it the platform model of like the, the Millenniums or Baliaznis of the world? Uh, is it decentralizing via DeFi? Do the funds go away, uh, or you know some combination? What, what what do you see as the future path for 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 fund structure? Hmm. I think it's a mix of all of the above that you mentioned. <laughs> I think we're seeing a small, a specialist crypto hedge funds continuing to evolve because they have become adept at navigating the operational complexities of this market, but I do think we'll see the emergence of platform type models from larger asset manager managers, firms with the resources to scale these innovations. I'm, I'm, and I'm seeing more and more traditional financial um, asset managers launching crypto funds. So adding a crypto fund to their already, you know, billion dollar, you know, AUM platform. And it actually sense. Um, at the same time, I think the DeFi space will continue to grow and decentralize, as I said, with a transition period. But institutional players will drive a lot of the future adoptions. I think it's hard to say if there's one clear direction. The entire asset management world is moving in. I think rather I see the ecosystem becoming more multifaceted with specialist managers, larger platforms, and these centralized structures are all playing an important role in the blockchain crypto space. 
And frankly, personally, I think what makes this space so exciting. That's probably a great place to uh, to to end uh, and wrap up. I've tried to weave in questions from everyone. If you if you throw in any in the chat, happy to address it for the end. Uh, but why don't we finish there with what most excites you in terms of innovation? You know, the wildest project that you've seen, or things that you think are unique applications of the technology that uh, people might not have have come across and might want to explore. Wow. I mean, there's so much happening right now. I think it's hard for me to pick just one. Um, so I will probably break it down into a few categories because there are different kind of like wild out there. Um, for me personally, personally, I'm fascinated by what's happening in augmented reality and extended reality. Um, as someone who loves art and fashion, I've seen some mind-blowing projects that blend design with XR. Um, I mean, I, imagine the future of fashion where you wear clothes with moving digital elements. And I was in, I was actually in Tokyo and I went to the Y3 store and they already have clothing that it can interact with your phone and things can come out of your clothes. I think that's fascinating. Again, that's on the more, more, more fun uh lighter you know uh development of technology but i think it's just incredible um i also met with the founder of a very interesting and powerful project that will be released next year uh in singapore that is using vr to reinvent the luxury retail world um and again this is not just a concept a major luxury group is already on board and behind of these projects so i'm excited to see what that looks like and then on a more serious note, uh, though maybe less fun, there are a few I saw in Texas specifically, a few defense simulators that are just jaw dropping. They're using hyper-realistic environments for training and strategy. And while I'm not sure they're necessarily great for humanity, I have to say that the tech behind them is very, very impressive. But in terms of projects that I am the most passionate about and that I can see they will have real global impact, one that really stood out to me was in Brazil, um, where they are using AI and blockchain to streamline agriculture supply chain. So think about how much food gets wasted due to the delays at ports and inefficiencies in transport is not only capital wasted, it's also food. So this project is actually tackling that project head on by optimizing the entire process, reducing waste, and ultimately, as I said, saving both food and money. So that's a kind of innovation that has the potential to make a massive difference globally. And that's the type of innovation that I'm most excited about. And this is one of the reasons um, we are launching next year a direct venture strategy for Latin America, because I do believe that these technologies will get implemented faster and more efficient in markets where they are needed, uh, like front-end markets, like I mentioned before, Southeast Asia, Africa, and LATAM as well. So I think these last project that I talk about in Brazil with supply chain, what is very interesting is that it ties into what we're seeing in the financial industry too. These are projects that use blockchain to streamline payment solutions. Um, so at the end, what is fascinating to me about the blockchain space is that everything is all connected and these innovations are starting to reshape in entire industries. And that's the reason why I joined this space. So that's very exciting. It's a very exciting time to live in. All right, Paula, I think I know I know you have something after this uh, and do not want to hold you up. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you for everyone uh, for joining the webinar. Uh, and thank you once again to our hosts at the CVA. Uh, and if you are interested to follow up, uh, you can contact through the CVA. Uh, you can contact Paula or myself directly. Uh, our uh, contact information will be made available in terms of uh, LinkedIn.